All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Koran Loser. I hope you're doing well. So, folks, I got a wild one for you today. We are going to talk about the interrogation of Dalton Aiken and what sets apart this interrogation from all the other interrogations we've talked about is that the wheels come off six minutes into the interrogation. Dalton goes from leaning in, confidently lying, chumming it up with the detectives, and then just a short six minutes later, the wheels completely and totally come off, and Dalton crashes and burns to the point where the detectives... I think are surprised. They probably have never seen it just happen so fast. They weren't even putting on any pressure. It was just the normal monotone questions to get the thing going. And one of the detectives who kind of looks like Stone Cold Steve Austin, I think he was more of the intimidator. When Dalton says the line, which we'll obviously go over that at six minutes, he either looks at the camera. I can't really tell. He either looks at the camera to go, is that thing filming? Please let that be filming. Or he looks at the other detective to go, that's it already? All right. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to tell you guys the backstory and then we will get into the interrogation. So for this one, we're going to Ogden, Utah. We have Mount Ogden to the east of the town. You have the Great Salt Lake to the west. It's pretty close, actually, to where I grew up, about a four-hour drive. And on a August night in 2018, Dalton Aiken went over to his longtime high school buddy, hunting buddy, went over to his longtime friend, Corey Fitzwater's house. So we have Dalton and Corey. And the reason Dalton was going over to Corey's house was because Corey's neighbor was having Corey do some work for them. And most of that work, I think, was break up a bunch of concrete. So Dalton goes over to Corey's. Dalton and Corey go over to Corey's neighbor. And as the story goes, as night falls on Ogden, Utah, on this summer night in 2018, Dalton and Corey are smashing a bunch of concrete with sledgehammers. Dalton would say that Corey seemed pretty smashed by the time he got there and said estimated total Corey. He thought Corey probably had 10 beers and he thought himself Dalton had five beers. So collectively, they're 15 beers in. They're smashing concrete for Corey's neighbor. And as you can imagine, pretty much everything after those 15 beers is incredibly sloppy. Just a total slop fest. So then again, the story goes, if you're talking to Dalton, that around midnight, they stopped busting up concrete. And then around, they were hanging out still, I guess, partying. And then around 2 a.m., again, this is according to Dalton, they wanted to get away from Corey's place because Corey was having marriage issues. Again, according to Dalton, Corey's wife had accused Corey of cheating, which Corey said that's just crazy, and he's not. But the fact that she would even ask made Corey think that maybe she was cheating. And so around 2 in the morning, as the story goes, Dalton and Corey went to a wooded area because they wanted to have a guy talk about Corey's marriage issues, I guess have another beer. And so while they're getting ready to go to this wooded area to smoke some weed, have a beer, talk about marriage issues, a couple miles away in the same wooded area, we have Brian Racine sleeping next to his campfire doesn't get any more natural human than that. Just a man sleeping by his campfire. And the reason that Brian Racine is sleeping next to a campfire in a wooded area close to Ogden, Utah, is because he lived in California and, according to his mother, really struggled with substance abuse and really struggled with mental illness and just was having a tough go of it and had a plan 
to leave California and come to Utah to become a Mormon. And at the time of this was homeless. I guess while he was hammering out becoming a Mormon and whatever that looks like, he was staying in this camping homeless type area. And like I said, around 2 or 3, uh, around 2 a.m., between 2 and 3 a.m., Dalton and Corey, 15 beers in, and before they left, Dalton said that he grabbed an iced tea and that Corey grabbed some beers and a gun. And they grabbed some, a bag of weed and they left to go to the wooded area to smoke some weed. Now is where the stories differ. We're, going, we're just going to go with Dalton's because that's whose interrogation we're going with. But you can imagine is Dalton, well, I guess I'll start with, so they get to this wooded area and one of them, as they're walking around in the darkness, again, 15 beers in, just sloppy, in despair, these two morons, and they come on old Brian Racine's camp. He's sleeping by his fire. You know, it can't be any less threatening than a man just sleeping next to his campfire. And Dalton will say that he didn't know about it, and Corey walked up, woke up poor Brian. They had a few words, and then Corey shot him in the head and killed him. Corey, you know, as the whole thing unfolded, would say it was the total opposite, that he had no idea that Dalton was going to do this, and Dalton walked up and killed Brian. They both immediately blamed each other, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So one of them shoots Brian for no reason while he's laying by his campfire, and then Dalton would testify later that then he started running around with his like a chicken with his head cut off. So you got you, that, you know, one of them did it, and then they're running around like crazy. And then a totally bizarre detail is he said that Chris, in the midst of running around ah, like crazy with a chicken with his head cut off, somehow Chris finds him as they're running around like crazy and hands him the gun. So now. This doesn't come up in the interrogation, but now Dalton says he's got the gun. Again, back to running around frantically. Dalton says he gets back to the car first, unloads the gun, waits maybe, I don't know, he said between 10 minutes and a half an hour for Corey to get back. When Corey gets back, Corey says something like he got, got in a fight, he ran into some people, got in a fight with them. And they get in the car to leave. Little did they know, a cop had already, while they had parked and then gone off to either, you know, smoke weed or kill Brian or whatever, God knows what these two were planning to do. While they were off doing their thing, a cop had noticed their car, come up, looked into it, goes, what the hell is this car doing here in the middle of the night? Saw either like weed or weed paraphernalia. And then just parked, kind of hidden, waiting for them to come back. Probably was a funny sight to see one of them come back running, undo, a, you know, un, like take the magazine out of a gun, take the bullets out, and then the other one comes back. And then right as they drive away, pretty much immediately, they get pulled over. Then they get brought, then adult, they get separated. Dalton, they're booked in, and as the sun came up over Mount Ogden that next morning, Dalton is in the hot seat. And like I said, he goes from confidently lying, leaning in, it's all about body language, baby, to the, he's leaning in so much, he's making such a big show of leaning in that it makes me think he watched it like a a body language video or even maybe one of these like interrogations because he's really leaning in towards the the detective but then as it goes on it's like the angle of his back and the wall gets smaller and smaller and smaller till some points he's smashed 
right back up against the wall like this. You know people have really lost the confidence when their posture is like this. They're just hugging themselves. It happens with comedians too, like when the crowd's good, you'll see a comedian leaning in, strutting around. I said it was my mother-in-law hat, you know? And then, it, but if the crowd doesn't like them, or the material's not going so great, or they're just not feeling it, they kind of retreat into this, just like, all right, so what else is going on? And so, like I said, Dalton, and you got to think at the beginning of this interrogation, if it was Corey, and he just out of the blue walked up and shot the poor Brian right there, and you had no idea it was going to do it, you would think you would um, either say nothing, because it's like, what am I, you know, you think you're either going to say absolutely nothing or just immediately say, yeah, I don't know. We've been friends for a long time, but I can't, I can't uh, stick up for him. He did it. But that's not what Dylan did. He, well, we'll see. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. All right. So, like I said, Dylan, he's booked in. He's already wearing kind of the jail garb. The detectives come in. Like a lot of times, they ask him, how is the sandwich we gave you? A lot of interrogations start with, how's the sandwich? And Dalton says, I ate the Oreos, but I didn't eat the sandwich. And the detectives make a joke, you got to start with the good stuff or something like that. Keeping it, it's always just bizarre how mundane the conversations are before it gets into the... So they're having some sandwich talk. They're reading him his rights. You know, classic. Dalton is leaning in this whole time. He's got this beard and his hair that looks like he needs a shower. And uh, he's leaning in and he's confident. And he's in uh he's he's kind of got this like jokey mood. I'm here to help. So the first question, again, no pressure really or anything. So it's just so what was going on this morning? And a leaning in confident Dalton says uh let's see I got pulled over and had marijuana and if it, if there wasn't other evidence like a shell casing and if he didn't if the whole wheels didn't come off at just the slightest bit of pressure where he pretty much confesses the simple story of we went to the woods to smoke some weed and, and then we got pulled over it's not the worst story you know we've I've seen a lot worse less believable stories than that so just on a pure uh, level of like this a believable story the first one he goes with he he goes through three throughout the interrogation and honestly it's not too bad but as you'll see doesn't really matter so he goes um all right so what was going on this morning he goes oh let's see i got pulled over and i had some marijuana and they go before that and he goes uh, we were walking in the wooded park, and they say, who were you walking with? And he says, Corey Fitzwater. And I think that's probably the first time of many that Dalton would say the name Corey Fitzwater to homicide detectives. So he brings in, now we have Corey Fitzwater introduced to the detectives. He says, what time did you guys get out there? He says, around two or three in the morning. And then Dalton tells the story to the detectives about how they were breaking up concrete and how it was it was really kind of fun hitting it and it bomb and the detective goes, Oh, there it was like therapy. And he goes, Yeah, exactly. And he's leaning in and everything's good. And we're probably what, two or three minutes in. And uh, so maybe the first hint of this is something really serious, maybe the first hint of pressure, but still not even really. The detective says, uh, I'm not worried about the weed. So you break concrete and then you go to this spot. And Dalton says, yeah. And he goes, did you see any, anyone else while out there, homeless people, anyone? And Dalton says, no, we just saw you know, some campfires scattered along the hillside. And he goes, how long? And the detective asks, how long were you up there? And Dalton says, enough time to smoke some marijuana. And so at this point, if you just have known nothing about the case and you see Dalton leaning in and just saying, yeah, I mean, we went to the woods to smoke and then we got pulled over. I, you know, I don't know. 
it doesn't it looks like Dalton if maybe he's innocent or maybe it's he's not a big role or I don't know it just doesn't seem like anything too much is gonna happen and now like I said here we are at just six minutes in the detectives are just asking the kind of chronological monotone not really any pressure questions and the whole thing just goes so here we are six minutes in the detective asks not really in even a threatening way did you guys hear any commotion while you were up there and if your goal is to try to lie your way out of this like Dalton admitted later he was trying to do he wanted the whole thing to just go away if that's your goal to lie and get out of it this has to be the worst answer that you could ever give so the detective said did did you guys hear any commotion while you were up there and Dalton says quote well I kind of have a feeling that I know what you guys are after. Like, did someone get killed? I mean, so I heard a gunshot for sure. And like I said, I think the detective is so surprised that he said it, the one that looks like Stone Cold Steve Austin, that he either looks at the camera going or he looks at the other detective. And it's, and the way that Dalton says it, like, did someone get killed? And uh, I heard a gunshot. I, he was expecting some sort of reaction. Like, the detectives were going to be like, yeah, buddy, now we're on your side. All right, that's what we were waiting for. Dalton, Dalton. And it's met with silence, nothingness. It's met with a look. And so Dalton, I think, thought that was going to be the thing. He goes, well, I kind of have a feeling that I know what you guys are after. Like, did someone get killed? I mean, so I heard a gunshot for sure. And so let's just go over that. Let's just go over that statement real quick. So by saying, well, I kind of know what I think you guys are after. He's pretty much saying I was lying. And then by saying like, did someone get killed? By saying that sentence, like, did someone get killed, he's pretty much saying, I am the one that either did it or I was standing so close to the person that did do it, I saw it happen enough to know that someone got killed. Or if I wasn't the person that did it or standing close enough to saw it happen, I must have been told by the person, if it is Corey that did it, I must have been told by that person on the way back to the car or in the car and so therefore I would have known about it because the detectives they didn't they hadn't said anything about anything yet they they didn't say that there was a gunshot they didn't say that the if there was a gunshot that the bullet went into somebody and they also didn't say that anyone was killed which was true so just right there it's over they got him they that's what they were looking for and I don't if I was the interrogator, I would have just stuck on that. It's like, okay, let's dissect that. I think that it happened so quick and so surprising. They, they didn't know quite what to do with it. They just kept going on with their strategy, which you'll see in a second. But right there, there's no real recovering from that. And so, again, it's met with just nothingness. That whole little monologue he does, like... Did someone get killed? <laughs> and, um, okay, so then he asks, where were you when you heard the gunshot? They didn't make a big deal about it, like, ha ha, you, that's it, you just confessed. And um, so they said, where were you when you heard the gunshot? And from here on, Corey goes through about three stories of what happened, and you can pretty much see Dalton when the detectives say something, like when they feed him a question, they'll be like, so did Corey, his second story, they'll be like, so did Corey at any point walk away from you at a certain point? And you can almost see Dalton changing his story as the questions come in, like, yeah, like he'll, he'll, he has these big reactions, like, yeah, he did leave, that's, 
that's what happened is he left and then it happened and I had no idea. And it's just obvious and it reminds me of how Stiven McDaniels would be like, body even that sentence or the little part right there where he was like like did someone get killed that reminds me of old steven's body so he admitted that they heard a gunshot and that somehow he knew that someone got killed but they keep going again slow monotone they go where were you when you heard the gunshot and uh dalton is like well we were by this vinyl fence next to an HVAC factory, I think. And they're making him kind of explain it. So then, and so they, I think they know that, that this story is definitely not true. So they're asking him, so then that, the, if that's, if you were at that vinyl fence, then the bullet would be to your north and just totally lying. Uh, Dalton's going, uh, yes, north, yes. And he's really like, agreeing in a friendly way. Let me grab a drink real quick. Everything is like, yes, detectives. Thank you for helping me with that part. And you get to start to see the detective strategy, which I don't love, come about. So then they ask, you know, what did you hear, see, and smell when the gunshot went off? And Dalton goes, nothing. And he goes, what did you guys do When you heard the gunshot, and Dalton says, um, you know, actually, we're pretty country, so we didn't pay too much mind to it, to tell you the truth. I thought it was weird how late it was, and they're kind of asking him. And so, just to quick summarize, his first story was that, that he's going with, is that Corey and him go out to smoke. They're standing by a, a vinyl fence by the HVAC factory, and that they heard a gunshot to the north. They thought it was late. And um, let's see. Hold on. Where am I at here? Standing. Okay. And then, so they kind of drop that. All right. You guys, are by, you guys are by the vinyl fence. Then they ask him, the gun in your car. Whose is that? And he goes, oh, that's Corey's. And some stuff have come out that Corey and Dalton were in the midst of, like, trading that gun that day. But I don't know if I could find enough information to even really know exactly what happened. But Dalton immediately says the gun is Corey's. The bullets were Corey's. I had some bullets in my pocket from we were shooting it earlier, but it's all Corey's. It's Corey's. And um, so then the detective goes, did you guys split up at any point? And Dalton goes, yeah, there was a couple leak breaks. I went off once to take a leak. Corey went off to take a leak. And that's one of the times where now his next story. So the first one, they're at the vinyl fence and they heard it. And then so story number two is that they're walking. And then Corey, now that he got the idea from, did Corey leave you at any point? Now that he has that idea, then story number two is that they were walking, Corey went off by himself, he heard the gunshot, Dalton did, going, oh my God, something bad happened, and then they raced to the car, and Corey didn't say anything. But again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So the detective asks, after he asked, did you guys split up ever, the detective asked, did anything else strike you as weird and odd? I thought it was a bit of a strange answer. Dalton says, yeah, the whole night, man, like, he passed his chest. Uh, gave me a bad feeling, and sure as heck showed up as a bad one. And the detectives are like, you care to articulate that? And and Dalton goes, kind of like the Holy Ghost, I guess. There's just some places you shouldn't be. And the detective goes, okay, how was Corey last night? And he talks about his wife accusing him of cheating, being upset. And then he also makes sure to bring in that Corey was in the war in Afghanistan. Total disaster, that was. Was in the war in Afghanistan you know, has some PS, PTSD things, and it's like, if, if he really does, 
and it sounds like he does, you know, that's really sad and tough. But if Dalton is using that to paint to the detectives, hey, it wasn't me, it was the PS PTSD guy, he has the war things, he kind of starts planting that into the de detective's head, you know, war stuff, PTSD. And then we get to a stopping point. I think that was the end of um, the detectives where they ask monotone questions to establish a timeline. So then the detective that you don't see, not the Stone Cold Steve Austin one, the one you don't see, says, okay, Dalton, after hearing all that, we have some area of concerns. And right now, remember at the beginning, we're about 16 minutes in. Remember at the beginning, Dalton's leaning in. He's confident. Now his back is flat against the wall, and he's going like this. And, he, and the detective goes, we don't see too many coincidences. You know, if two things seem like they're tied together, usually they're tied together. Would there be, Dalton, would there be any reason why we would find a spent shell casing at the scene that matches the gun that you guys had, Corey's gun or the one that you traded or whatever. And Dalton, here's that question, which, and it's who knows if there was a shell casing there. These could just be all bluffs by the, by the detectives. Dalton doesn't even consider that. Everything they said, he just goes, what? Okay, yeah, and just tries to curate his story for what they just said. So again, they say, Dalton, is there any reason why there should be a shell casing of the matching the gun that you guys happen to have at two in the morning in the wooded area with the guy that got shot? And Dalton goes, exact same tone as Stiven with the body. He goes, ah, I'm going to come clean right now. And the stone cold Steve Austin guy, he's going like this, goes, thank you. I kept picture him going, thank you, brother. But he goes, thank you, because the forensic evidence tells a story and you're not helping yourself. And now we get to hear story number two. So back, pressed against the wall, hugging himself for dear life, all the confidence gone, Dalton says, um, so Corey did leave. And that's when I heard the gunshot. And that is, that, he goes, and that is it, man. As if they're going to hear that and go, okay, you're done. Go home, get a good night's sleep, get a shower, get a meal. He goes, and that is it, man. That's when we left and he didn't say. And um, Dalton's not, look, he's pretty much wilted at this point, like a guilty dead weed. And um, and something I kept thinking about is if you were going to roll over on your longtime friend, which in this case, I think you have to, there's no, if it was Corey, you got to do it right at the beginning. Dalton would later say on the stand that he was just terrified of Corey and terrified of the police and terrified of the whole thing. So he tried the lie thing at first. And then when it didn't work, he was like, okay, I'm going to be honest and just say it was Corey. But he, he got the best of both worlds. He, or he got the worst of both worlds. He looks incredibly guilty. No one's on his side. He's lumped in as an accessory if it was Corey. And also he just, he, he rolled over on his friend. If he just would have done it at the beginning, he wouldn't look like an accessory. Or if you just couldn't roll over on your friend no matter what, then you just he would should have just said nothing. There's no way that you can come in there and lean in and just make it work. Okay, so... So now the detectives are acting like, all right, we'll go with you on this one. So they say, how was Corey after he shot the guy and then didn't say anything? And then, and uh, Dalton goes calm. He seemed more relaxed. And the detective goes, you say this is truth. You need to forget about covering for Corey. And Dalton goes, okay. And pretty much everything that detectives say at this point Dalton just goes, okay, okay. We don't want to drag these answers out of you. All the details you're thinking about, all the details you're thinking about you now, you're not protecting Corey if you're telling the truth. 
And then you get to see this strategy that I probably the detectives had since the very beginning. I think that they should have strayed off at the six minute mark when uh, Dalton said, you know, did some like did somebody get killed? I think I would have just stuck on that and said, Dalton, you said that that puts you, you know, that that says a lot of things that you said that. Let's talk about that. But the detective strategy is they set up this thing where they say, Dalton, either you're a witness, a suspect, or an accessory. And so when it seems like Dalton's lying, they'll be like, do you want to be a witness or an accessory? And they, you know, they steer, they kind of start steering him with this, like, nah, that was not what a witness would do. But the funny thing is, is Dalton's mind is either racing too much to understand, or maybe he just doesn't even know what those three words mean. But the Stone Cold uh, Steve Austin detective goes, because if you're not a witness, what are you? And Dalton goes, a bystander? And the Steve, Stone Cold Steve Austin detective goes, no, a suspect. And they start to get frustrated because Dalton's not getting it. And he goes, do you want to be a suspect, an accomplice, or a witness? And Dalton goes, well, I didn't do anything, so I don't want to be any of those. And they go, no, you want to be a witness. And then there's like a funny like justice system lesson where they're like, no, okay. So there's, there's witnesses, and then there's... Uh, um, there's suspects and then there's accomplices and they like teach him this little lesson and he's going, Oh, okay. Yes. I want to be a witness. And in my opinion, the detectives were just owning the whole thing. They had him. There's no reason to set up this just simplistic strategy like Dalton, you're sounding again like an accomplice. You better step over into the witness. And they say it so many times, it starts to even sound like some joke where they're like, so a suspect and accomplice walk into a bar. But anyway, that's the strategy. And they're saying either you're a good witness or you're an accomplice. If he shoots someone and you're there and you don't do anything, you're an accomplice and you share his prison sentence. And you see Dalton's face when he, when you say when he says that share the prison sentence. And I don't know if I've ever heard a detective almost threaten the prison sentence. I don't know if you could do that. But anyway, whatever it is, it's working. Dalton is just getting yanked all over wherever they want him. So they're saying you share his prison sentence. So you don't want to be that guy. And Dalton goes, no, no, I don't. And they're saying, okay, so let's go back. The old classic interrogation. Let's go back and tell the whole story again. Now that you know that you want to be a witness and not a suspect or an accomplice. And so the detective goes, all right, so let's go all the way back. So you're trying to tell us that you guys randomly went to this spot, were randomly walking around, randomly went to some random guy's camp and shot him. And, um, and Dalton goes, yeah, that sounds bad. And... Um, so then we get Corey's number three. And so Corey's just desperate at this point. So he goes, okay, yeah, so Corey went off the trail and I followed him. And he shot the guy. And then the tech goes, so you were there. Going all the way back to when it came off 16 minutes, when he's like, like, did someone die? It, it, you, you would have had to have known. So they kind of knew that already. And they go, so you were there. And Dalton goes, yeah, I seen it. He goes, the guy was sleeping on the ground. Corey walked up, mumbles in some drunk words to him and then shot him and they ran and they ran back to the truck and then i think the detectives are all bluffing during this whole part they're just trying to get every little bit because every time he says something like that and maybe this is the true story but dalton didn't do himself any favors by just lying and getting yanked in all these directions that you can't believe him no matter what he says even if this is the real story so the detective says, well, that's not what the forensic evidence says. 
and then one the detective goes, I know the evidence. I want you to be honest and be a witness to this and not a suspect. And then it's like, I think the detective's pushing it a little far. The other one goes, I just left the scene with, C- with CSI. I know exactly what happened there. It's like, all right, buddy, calm down, CSI. But Dalton's mind is just racing and too much has happened and he doesn't have the wherewithal to sit there and think are these guys just full of it should i just not say anything anymore is this going well am i tanking what's happening and so they're saying i just left csi i know exactly what happened so you better keep talking witness boy no they didn't say that but so then dalton goes oh yeah one of his many like oh yeah i'll Since you scared me, I'll say more. So he goes, oh yeah, I was running and I lost him and I got back to the truck first and I waited for 25 minutes. That's probably what you guys are um, talking about that I left out. And they're like, no, I don't think so. And he basically, at that point, Dalton's like, no, I promise you, I promise you. And the detectives kind of look at each other and go, All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to leave the room. We're going to let you think about your story. Just think how many different versions of the story just in that short 30 minutes came out. So he says, we're going to give you a second to think, and then we're going to come back. And you're going to tell the story again. And again, it's like, we want you to be the witness. So then they leave. Dalton is just sitting there alone, and then... The detectives come back in again. They ask him about the sandwich. How was the sandwich? And Dalton goes, I'm having a little bit of trouble eating today. And they say, Dalton, uh, we're actually going to bring you across town. We're going to, um, you were booked into like a jail across town. We're going to bring you back over there. So the story is they bring him back over there. The questioning continues for six, seven hours blames cody um i'm trying to think they played a they played a snippet from that chunk of questioning at the other place for six and uh, six or seven hours where he says something like no one believes me no one believes me i should have just told the truth no one believes me and um that was played in his trial so his dalton's trial was this past june this summer And he was convicted of murder. Uh, It sounds like, if I understand it right, is Dalton and Corey, it was a big thing, are the trials going to be together or separate? They decided to do them separate. Dalton's has already happened. Chris was going to happen a couple months ago, November of 2020, but it's been pushed to 2021. So when it gets going, we'll definitely follow that one. But Dalton's was this past summer in June, pretty quick and easy. He was convicted of murder and a couple other charges, and he got 16 years to life. He did take the stand in his trial where, again, he just said he was totally scared and just wanted the whole thing to go away, and that's why he lied at first before just saying that it was Corey. During the whole pre-trial stuff, Corey, can't make this stuff up, Corey paid a convicted child murderer that's in prison, he paid him to snitch on Dalton, to like come up with a story and say to the detectives in the prison or jail or whatever it was, like, hey, I got something to tell you guys. And so you can watch it also on uh, Real, Real World Police's channel. They bring in this convicted child murderer, jailhouse snitch. He's got this bizarre shaped head. So they bring this guy in and he's just rambling. You can tell he's lying, just trying to make up, saying, yeah, I talked to this guy Dalton in the jail and he said that he's the one that killed the guy and the other guy, Chris, had nothing to do with it. So that was a bizarre turn. And so now... Like I said, Dalton is serving a 16-year to life for murder, and Cody now, his trial is pending, and it's pretty much the same evidence that was in the Dalton case. It's So maybe he's looking at similar. 
I don't know if the state even knows to this day who, which one actually pulled the trigger, but they convicted Dalton. They, I guess there was enough evidence that they convicted him of, of murder. And so Corey will have the same fate and we will follow it. Keep it here on True Crime Loser. I'm going to cut it off there. Happy New Year's, everybody. Thank you so much to everybody that supports this channel. We have so much fun. I love making the videos. I love you all. I will see you soon. Why, Stavin, why? Shamita.